Next, we, we have uh, a panel which is securing the future of our digital child. We'll be joined by Rob Hillard, who's the managing partner of the Deloitte Consulting Asia Pacific, by Angie uh, Abdilla, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Old Ways New Australia, also a professor of practice of faculty of arts and uh, architecture and design at the University of New South Wales. We have Toby Walsh, who's a laureate fellow and sentient professor of artificial intelligence at the University of New South Wales and David Pryor, who's the senior team leader for energy security safeguards at the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. So our, our, the way we'll work today is, is similar to the, the previous panel. We'll have a, a short piece from Rob, then from Angie, then Toby, and then David, then we'll switch to Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rob Hillard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to add my acknowledgements of the Indigenous owners of the lands on which we all attend today. For me, that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, I'm a technologist, and that means I spent my career working to advance the use of various technologies throughout business and society. I'm a technology optimist in that when I see a new technology, I'm instinctively excited for the possibilities of what it can bring. But I'm also a technology realist in that I know that all technologies have consequences and our history in this regard is not always one we can be proud of. Thousands of years of agrarian technology has left much of our soil infertile. Hundreds of years and more of weapons and transport technology have enabled invasions which have left entire cultures displaced. 200 years of industrial revolution has choked our atmosphere and some decades of information and digital revolution has threatened our very self-identity and privacy. We can and must do better for the digital child that was born yesterday. The very term digital child will likely be much like the identity of millennials, Generation Y, and all those that go before. Even before our digital child is an adult, the quantum child will likely already have been born. And the worries that we're talking about today will seem to be from a kinder and gentler age, given the dangers they could be facing. The quantum child will face a generation of artificial intelligence that will make today's data-driven algorithms look like they're from preschool. The quantum child may encounter chemicals and drugs designed with quantum computers in record time with or without proper testing. The quantum child might even be embedded at birth with an operating system to support their learning and growth. So let's do better than add a digital band-aid to today's problems and learn from history to create a template for technology for the future. We can design the governance of technology into the very processes that adopted into our society going forward, starting with the digital society of today and keeping an eye to the quantum future of tomorrow and a determination to be stewards of a cleaner world. We should use all of the tools available to realise the best of our digital lives while minimising the downsides. The first tool is yet more technology to manage the technology. Typically, humanity has invented its way out of many of the disasters of its own making from fertilisers to recover from over-farming to catalytic converters to replace lead in petrol that was poisoning last century's children. We have the opportunity now to architect technology, transparency, constraints, security and sustainability into the solutions that are brought to market through better collaboration between inventors, technologists and the community. Now, the second tool is the culture we build around the products we surround ourselves with. From our expectations of privacy to a demand for fairness, we can influence the society that our digital child grows up in. And finally, the tool we always need but should constantly use with caution is regulation and legislation. We do have a right to ask our government to put boundaries around the use and intrusion of technology, even if they are more in the form of speed limits to allow our first two tools to catch up. So, let's insist that rather than just quietly tracking our activities, we get control of our own data protection of our privacy, transparency of algorithms, and perhaps even an open curriculum for the training of artificial intelligence. We must also combine our digital revolution with a green technology transformation. Let's agree the community expectations, not only for those of us producing and implementing digital solutions, but also our expectations of each other in how we all behave, engage, and transact in our digital society. And, Let's engage in a properly informed debate about the regulations and laws we need, from cryptocurrency to social media, 
in the full knowledge that every decision made now likely needs to be reviewed on a cycle that is much shorter than any government is used to. Now, if we do our jobs properly, as the stewards of society while our digital child grows up, we can be confident that they will inherit a world that is better than ours. Fail, and I truly, I truly fear for the quantum child. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, we really are getting some, some strong themes coming out from our session today. Uh, Andy, back to you, please. Hi, um, I would also like to acknowledge the land on which I am on today, uh, Wongul country, which is uh, sort of at the intersection of um, Gadigal and Wongul. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and on also emerging. This acknowledgement is uh, with deep resonance. Um, I think it's important to just note that we're also the oldest continuum living culture on this planet. We're also the oldest living continu continuum of civilization on this planet. And what this means is we have, um, when we think about the dry, that we're also on the driest continent on earth, we um, have an opportunity to think back on how our societies and how our culture has has not just um, has has not just been how, how we've not just been in survival, but we've also been a thriving community. So it's these knowledges and these cultural knowledges and knowledge systems that have supported our communities over millennia. So it's in these various different knowledges and knowledge systems where there is an incredible opportunity to explore the design and engineering principles and practices that have supported uh, also a millennia of different technology design um, technologies uh, that have come from these various different cultural knowledges and knowledge systems. At the heart of these knowledges and knowledge systems are a, a number of different core principles principles and practices that also align to uh, a, a lot of other different indigenous communities around the globe. Those uh, principles and practices come back to this care of country and the care of kin. So we understand ourselves as, as part of country and country is part of us. So a lot of this work has supported um, a, a long history of different research and development over a number of years. Uh, what um, we've been working on is a, a whole bunch of different um, programs and initiatives, a lot coming back to the in, uh, Indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence work that started back in 2017. It was really spawned by um, a research paper I wrote about uh, Indigenous pattern thinking, which is different to I guess, um, the language and principles of software engineers, uh, but how Indigenous pattern thinking can inform various different ways of uh, conceptualizing and practicing automation. That work then has informed, um, as I said, a number of different programs and initiatives over the years. And most recently, we've uh, uh, just published a paper for UNESCO on the blind spots of AI. And that's titled um, Out of the Box, Indigenous Protocols for AI. So I'll, I'll talk about a couple of different points within this paper, which is also co-authored with uh, Python Young Kapoor, Nikki Kapoor, and Rick Shaw, business technologists. So uh, the first point that I want to make is around um, the the language we often hear around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Who sits at the table really matters. Um, what I think I've been I've what I've been noticing a lot over the years is the, the flattening of these of this term equity, diversity and inclusion. And often what we find is that there's a, um, a reductionist approach to these concepts that um, we need more brown skinned people to be more cogs within the machine. So I, what, we, what I think we've been um, exploring a lot um, in this new role that I've taken on with the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Future Council for AI and Humanity. We've been exploring how this, we can ex expand out what we, um, what we know of when we talk about uh, equity, diversity and inclusion to actually exploring what different cultural 
diversity means within the conceptual design and development of AI from a systems perspective, all the way through to um, you know, concepts of you know future of work and how do we how do we actually vision the future of work when when from an indigenous perspective uh, this concept of waged work is actually quite a relatively new phenomenon. So equity and diversity matters, but also I think what also is incredibly important is the languages and definitions and the ways we measure things. The intercultural understandings of relationality are extremely, um, I guess there's a lot of assumptions that are that are taken into account that are that are just assumed when when we're uh, looking at the various different uh, problematic issues within the design, development, and uh, practices of engine, uh, software engineering and AI. Uh, relationality is is a in, an incredibly um, deep and complex uh, concept when we when we think about relationality from an indigenous perspective. Relationality comes from uh, various different worldviews, and from an indigenous perspective, relationality is often um, underpinned by these various different knowledge systems. For us, once again, it's it's country and kin. How we relate to each other comes back to our understanding of kinship systems and the various different cultural knowledge systems that, for example, um, that exist within country, but also um, in deep time and also um, is present within our future thinking. So relationality, when, we're, when we consider that within the uh, conceptual design and development of AI, can take on a whole different array of um, forms and also opportunities if we are able to embrace the cultural diversity when we're talking about equity, diversity and inclusion. Those, um, those principles of equity, diversity, inclusion and relationality also um, need, I guess, uh, a different framework of uh, within the practices of software engineering. Those alternate methodological approaches to software engineering are incredibly important when we're when we're futuring the states of what AI is now, but also can become. If we think of those sophisticated knowledge systems that exist within our in our worldview, in our paradigm, um, we look towards, for example, a kinship system. Kinship systems. Uh, across this continent quite diverse, but their primary function was to keep the bloodlines clean within our communities. So as a system, what we can see within that example is that we had no disease before the Europeans came. No disease whatsoever. We had illness and ailments, but not disease. And so through these really um, important marriage laws that uh, that have been designed to support small groups of people uh, breeding across the uh, inter-clan relationships. What we find here is an, one of many different examples of a cultural knowledge system that has supported the health and well-being and nurturing of both country and kin. Those particular um, examples uh, have been what we've uh, one, just one example of uh, some of the prototyping that we've been exploring within this work with Indigenous Protocols and AI. We've been looking at one particular kinship system and, and the core marriage laws or the key patterns and algorithms within those particular kinship systems and looking to see how they could inform genetic algorithms. What we've found is that um, once again, coming back to the, you know, the, imp the incredible importance that we um, place on methodology, if who sits at the table matters. What we found was that um, when we have a bunch of developers that don't have the cultural capacity to understand the importance of these different, uh, the nuances within these different knowledge systems and the various different governance and protocols and the various different um, uh, uh, design uh, and development decisions that what what tends to happen is a, a whole bunch of different cultural biases and assumptions get baked into 
um, all, all parts of the design process and the development process. And of course, the outcomes reflected um, didn't reflect what we what we knew what could have been. So, so you know how we measure things also matters. You know, testing on the principles of speed, efficiency, and productivity are of course culturally misaligned to the way that we understand the how we nurture our country and kin. So that was another um, assumption that we found was incredibly important and came once again came back to the lack of cultural capacity that our developers had. So um, trans, what we found was that there was a need for us to start developing a framework that could support the cultural capacity that, that, these, that our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters need to have to be able to work with us and the various different complex systems that, we're, that we understand can inform better systems design. So translating those cultural standards and, and Indigenous cultural protocols into the pro programming logic is possible, but it does require, it requires cultural capacity. What we found was that there was there there is a way to be able um, to apply this particular framework across a, ver a variety of different programming languages and also different uh, subsets within AI. But um, the and, and I'll go through the, the, these core principles within this framework. So what we found was that first and foremost, developing the cultural insight was was important. So for example, indigenous data including secret and sacred knowledge are vulnerable to extractive digital technologies. That insight can then be translated into a, um, a cultural ethic. So permissions must be sought from custodians who speak for country before restricted knowledge and sites can be accessed by appropriate kin. That particular cult cultural ethic can then be translated into a standard. Restricted knowledge must be protected from inappropriate access and exploitation from outsiders. From here, what we found is that there's a need to translate language and knowledges into the um, programming logic. So first and foremost, into, the, a, um, into a programming standard and protocol would be to access to restricted knowledge on country and online is contingent to on approval by appropriate cultural authority. That, co that programming uh, protocol can then be translated into code or application. So in this particular instance, we found, we decided that the, a proof of IT encryption into a smart contract application for elders to grant or deny access to restricted sites and terrestrial and digital. So there is a, there is, um, I think a lot more work for us to do in developing out this framework and testing it in a variety of different uh, programming with a variety of different programming languages and also different environments. But I think that there, that so much of this work comes back to us being able to support the cultural capacity of developers and also have, once again, the right people sitting at the table. Thanks very much, Angie. That's uh, certainly a, a different perspective from what we've been talking about uh, up until now. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Toby, I'm going to pass to you and then, then to David for just for your opening statements and then we've got some questions coming in from the audience. Uh, Toby, you'll need to unmute. Thank, thank you, Ian. Um, I, I want to begin by paying my respects to the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands I'm sitting and extend those respects. Um, and that historical remembrance of where we come from is, is where I want to begin my remarks. I want to wind forward um, thousands of years of history, but, but to remember that AI is not magic. This isn't the first technology that's touched our lives. Um, and we should learn from that history. And we go back to the first industrial revolution and look back at how we navigated that time. And we came out of it much better, quality of our lives has increased dramatically, even in um, developed countries, life expectancy has almost doubled. So, um, and um, 
we have prospered greatly, but it wasn't without pain. And it wasn't without structural and systematic change. We made some really significant changes to the way we ran our society to ensure the benefits were shared around. We, we introduced unions and labor laws and uh, the welfare state and universal pensions. We did a lot of things. Um, there were a lot of people um, who came together uh, for the collective good to ensure um, that we shared the prosperity that the technology brought. And, and I feel, feel that we really face a, uh, another technology that's going to disrupt our lives in an equally significant way as the steam engine and electricity did. Um, that we do need to think of such large scale changes. Um, and one of those that hasn't been much talked about today, um, but I think is going to be incredibly important just as it was important in the first industrial revolution was regulation. Um, I think many people are starting to realize you only have to open the newspaper to see the, the discussion going on. Um, if we go back 10 years ago, uh, when I was working in AI, um, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, there was a feeling then that regulation was unnecessary um, because we were still, much of what we were doing was still in the laboratory, um, that you um, couldn't regulate um, these technologies. They were somehow different from the physical world. They were digital, they were crossing international boundaries and that you couldn't and, and that you shouldn't, that it would stifle innovation if you did. Um, and perhaps that was true 10 years ago, but that's no longer true. You definitely, it's definitely necessary. You can and you should. Um, and we have some very good examples already of how you can do that. If we look towards Europe, for example, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, um, demonstrates that you can give people back um, some of the privacies that were lost um, by the introduction of some of these digital technologies. That um, is only, of course, the beginning. It's not an end. Um, and we are seeing um, the AI Act and various other innovations taking place. Um, if, if we look at a, uh, an area like social media, um, I'm always bemused by things like the Cambridge Analytical scandal. People have focused there upon um, the privacy loss. And people, of course, should be out, rightly outraged that our data was misused in that way. Um, but actually, there were a deeper problem, a deeper challenge that Cambridge Analytica throws up is what that data was used for. It was used to manipulate how people vote. And that's unfortunately where AI um, puts these problems on steroids. It allows you, with machine learning, to micro target your, uh, your interventions. Uh, and the dangerous uh, truth there is that humans can be hacked. Uh, and these tools allow you to do that at scale and speed and, and at cost that you could never do before. I think when we, we talk about social media, we should realize um, that it is uh, another media form. It's in, in some sense um, more powerful um, than old fashioned media. Um, and coming back to the idea of regulation, there is lots of areas where we should be regulating uh, social media more forcefully. We should be applying existing laws uh, where applicable, but equally, um, we should be holding uh, the social media companies liable for their content. If they are going to disrupt our political or democratic processes by allowing untruths um, to be uh, broadcast and um, amplified, um, then they need to be held liable to take that down. Um, I'm always surprised that we have strong limits in most countries on the amount of money you can spend on political advertising in old fashioned media, on television, uh, and in print, because we, of course, we want the best ideas um, to procreate. We want uh, the people with the most democratic support to receive um, the democratic vote. We don't want the media barons or the people with the, you know, with the deepest wallets to win. And yet we don't seem to have those same limits on social media, which is in some sense, I said, more, more powerful. Um, and we did have uh, the minister mention the metaverse. Um, I think that's somewhere we, we need to be very concerned. Um, we perhaps missed the boat with social media, uh, and I'm concerned that we'll miss the boat with the metaverse. We see there's a land grab quite clearly happening. Um, Facebook, Microsoft, um, there is a race to be the company in control of the metaverse. Uh, when ultimately, uh, we don't want it to be a walled garden uh, where rent seeking is, is common and where, where um, bad behavior is allowed to flourish. We want it to be a, a global common good. And that's only going to happen um, if, we, if we do regulate. Uh, of course, there are a couple of other themes. Um, there, are, there are many challenges, many, many opportunities 
the digital age poses, um, and the solutions aren't um, are many manifold. Um, we had uh, a very fine call for education, which I will second um, from Verity and, and various others this morning. Um, AI is not magic, despite what Hollywood would have us believe, um, and we need an informed uh, populace um, to be able to make the right decisions um, as consumers, as, as, as active citizens within our society to ensure that. I, I've always find it strange that we, we go to a lot of effort to teach children calculus as though we live in a mechanical world, whereas actually today we live in a digital world. We should be teaching computation before we teach calculus. We should be teaching AI before we teach um, differential equations. Uh, there's a very fine program in, in Finland to teach 10% of the population about artificial intelligence to give them a basic understanding of what AI is. Uh, we should have such a scheme in here in Australia. Um, it shouldn't be for 10% of the population. I would like it be, to be for everyone, just like we expect everyone to understand basic mathematics. If AI is going to be a fundamental basic part of our lives, we need everyone to understand it. Um, if anyone with deep pockets or any uh, philanthropists are listening, um, I'd be happy to discuss how we could how could we could spend some of your money to achieve that. Um, and finally, I am a technologist, and there are um, technologies that we need to work on to, to help us debug solutions. Um, but it's worth pointing out that in many settings there is no unbiased solution. Um, if we're selecting a small number of people uh, with machine learning to call for interview, that's a, a biased set. We want to select out the most deserving people. Um, and what computers are doing is putting those questions on steroids. It's asking us to be very precise, very mathematical about you know, what is a fair and just uh, selection of people um, to call uh, for interview. Um, so it puts many questions that we've sort of uh, rushed over in the past uh, into, into stark contrast. Uh, and the final observation I want to make is that um, transparency is, of course, a good thing. And certainly we can improve the transparency of many of the decision-making algorithms. But it is not an end. Uh, you listen to some people, I mean, it's the central uh, ethical principle, for example, that IBM has, um, but it is not an end. It is a means to an end. Um, there are many settings where we don't want transparency. I don't want Google search algorithm to be more transparent because that will allow more people to manipulate it. Uh, there are plentiful settings where uh, transparency is not actually desirable and not even possible. My doctor, uh, is not particularly transparent in her decision making, but I trust my life uh, in her hands because I know there are the right institutions and regulations around her to ensure that she doesn't have to explain everything. I don't have to be a medical expert to, to trust her that there is an institution and systems in place. Um, and that's what we want with AI. We don't want, we don't expect the whole world to understand the intricacies of all our AI algorithms. That would be unrealistic and undesirable. Um, but we do want to have the systems and institutions in place um, that allow us to trust uh, the systems are acting in our best interest. At the end of the day, I'm a glass half full person. However, whilst I'm optimistic in the long term that AI and other technologies will allow us to address many of the wicked problems like the climate emergency, like the increasing inequality within our society, I am somewhat pessimistic that it is a very bumpy road the next decade or two, uh, we face um, some incredibly challenging problems. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if we look at areas like the climate change, politics has let us down and we now need technological solutions. Um, and it's interesting to hear the discussions around COP26 and how science and technology is now accepted by everyone to be the only solution to the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Toby, and I think that's a nice segue to uh, David. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, uh, everyone. Um, so I'll try to uh, keep my end of the, the bargain up here. So um, I think, you know, for me, this um, today's native, I guess, digital native children, I would say they live in the, this online world and they share experiences online in a way that's just unknown to us. Um, you know, think about my children, they're eight and 10, um, they, you know, just when well, they've gone back to school. But, you know, when I was thinking about this, they're doing classes every day on Zoom and and they're on their devices and on my devices. They just poke around into everything. Settings have changed, background and profile pictures are updated. They talk to Google to find things out and they're already 
skeptical that uh, most of the information they read and see has been altered in some way to make it more attractive to their brain. But one thing I think for them, and I can correct on to the child who you know is born on the day of the conference, is that they just expect everything to be online. They expect all services to be connected. They can't work out why I have to print out a PDF and sign it and take a picture and send it back in an email. And they just expect and they demand this extreme customization of their world that I just have never experienced or even had thought was possible uh, for me. So, you know, like eight year old plays this educational games on Scratch. Um, he's in there, he's coding, he's changing graphical elements, you know, he's doing all of these things to shape what's seen. So I would say, you know, they live happily in this mass of data and what they see at the moment seems mostly about themselves in social media and online games. But when they do their homework, uh, you know, children now and the children of the future, they're seeking and searching for meaningful data and information. They're wondering what's real and what's not. And, you know, for me, I imagine, you know, what if we could fill that gap with credible interconnected data sets that give agency, um, you know, to plants and animals, and buildings, and resources, even legislation. You know, and these kids, they're going to learn to code at school and they shape their online universe. Um, and they want to tell their own story. And you can see, you know, through the um, COVID pandemic, you know, people searching the New South Wales data sets and making their own uh, websites. And I think just to bring it back to this future, really, you know, these children, they want to use that data to make sense of the carbon constrained world that they're living in and, and work out ways to prosper and accept the scarcity. You know, I just, I think we look at the, you know, we have that Earth Overshoot Day uh, when the uh, humanity's demand for ecological resources and services is exceeded. Last year, it was on the 29th of July. So when we say to these children, oh, well, you know, technology will solve everything, you know, um, uh, it's really hard to answer that question. Well, if you know we're all on Earth and we've used up all the resources in half a year, like how do we how do we get to that? So I think for us, um, you know, there's a big job in starting to build those data sets to create a connection between the online universes that you know we'll be creating into the future and the naturally built environments using data. So thinking about our work in the New South Wales government, we've started some of that already. Um, coding rules that support legislation so we can create building blocks to speed up data sharing and make shared ontologies uh, by tracking resource life cycles through materials passports and digital twins that can help un, you know, end unnecessary consumption and by tracking and sorting trash, uh, bringing resources back into the economy, um, tracing supply chains and helping to um, you know, join up sustainable development goals and the abolition of modern slavery with those resource consumption. So I think, you know, this all adds up to a lot of hype in technology that it might help to solve the climate crisis and that we're safe and secure. There's been a lot of pro promises made and, you know, a lot of failing along the way. So, you know, it's not to say technology is bad, but I think we really need to be wary of the promises made by technologists and, um, but, Really, one of the things to hone in on, and as we've heard, you know, from the Minister Dominello, um, the importance of data ownership and the impact it can make on our lives uh, is a really big thing because that big data can reinforce the values we uphold, and if we embed those values as to do with, uh, you know, nature and uh, net zero emissions by 2050, then we can use that to drive change through digital twins, smart cities, connected farm, you know, democratizing the data, we can give that agency and value and power to nature. And we can help see the limits of the system we live in and maybe learn a, a new uh, way to be frugal with our lives um, and to balance those needs. So um, those shared data, you know, hopefully leads to shared metrics and allows that trajectory to happen. And um, if we can link those things together, maybe we've got a shot with uh, open and trusted government data being a key to a net zero future and uh, you know having a shot to fulfill those sustainable development goals we'll talk about. Thanks David. Uh, 
I've been doing a very bad job of, of chairing this session. Uh, we, we have about 15 minutes left for questions, but there's a, there's a really important question that I, I, I want us to end on, but I, so I'm going to put it out there right now, and I'd like you to think about it whilst we're talking about other things. This event is meant to be a purposeful event. It's not meant to be just a conversation. Conversations are important. They help us identify issues, and there have been some really important issues identified yesterday and also today, and some really important themes that are coming out. The question I, I want you to think about for a little bit is, what do we do? What do we do Monday? What do we do about where we find ourselves? What do we do about these issues we've identified? Yesterday, we, we talked a lot about the impact of, of data and the challenges associated with it. It's come up, of course, again today repeatedly. We projected forward to 2050 and we said by then we should have sorted out the use of data. But I, I want you to come back with what do we do? What do we start doing immediately? What do we start doing in the medium term? That's not the question I'm going to ask right now. That's what I want you to think about when we, when we wrap this session up. The first question actually comes, it, it's an interesting one, and it talks about the leverage that social media platforms have and what we might do about that. And the, the, the question goes along the lines of the, we could regulate interoperability between social media platforms, human and machine readable uh, formats, enabling switching to a decentralized and federated alternatives. So effectively limiting the monopoly or the, the power of, of large social media platforms uh, described as data moats and, and network effects. What, what, what might we do to mandate interoperability between social media platforms. Well, let me ask a, a, a different question. Should we do something about social media platforms? And Rob, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Ian. That's a, that's a fantastic question. It's one, years ago, I wrote a, um, an article and I predicted probably about five years ago that we would have interoperability between the social media platforms. So I think we've proven that it hasn't happened on its own. When the, I, I made the assumption because when the first telephone networks came out, they were, they were private, they were not interoperable, but they became interoperable without regulation being the overwhelming driving force. That came slightly afterwards. Um, for about 15 years, there's been a patent held by, by uh, one of the big technology companies on <laughs> interoperability of the cell phone network. Um, and the basis of the patent is that uh, you, you break the connection between a handset and the network and you allow each tower to uh, bid for your service on a micro basis. The, that's never been realized because there's never been a regulatory framework that actually enables or encourages that to happen and supports the capital investment. We can learn from that, and uh, there are a number of uh, models for social media interoperability. Uh, we probably need to insert some of the regulations that Toby was talking about and I talked about in, um, in, in there to make it happen but it's very much in all of our interests that it does happen. Ultimately, with the right settings, it's actually in big tech's interests as well. Thanks very much, Rob, just getting myself off mute. It's, it's, an inter it's certainly an interesting point. Um, David or Toby, do you have a view on, on social media platforms? Anything you'd, you'd like to speculate? Yeah, we, we, we definitely need to regulate to ensure um, that um, you know, why, why is it that more people haven't logged off of Facebook? I mean, I, I've logged out of Facebook for the last time, but why haven't more people? And the reason, the reason is because um, everything that you own there, or your photographs, or your friends, stay. So if you log off, you're the person who's harmed. Um, there isn't an easy way for you to go elsewhere. But it goes beyond just um, data interoperability. I mean, that's certainly a start. Um, but I think we have to think the, about the wider antitrust issues. Um, is it to our advantage that Facebook own um, Instagram? Um, um, no, it's not. Um, there isn't true competition. Um, and we do have to, um, in, just as in other industries where large players have um, rents sought and um, run monopolies or, or near monopolies, um, we need to um, forcibly ensure that um, there is um, proper competition. Yeah, I mean, to me, I just I feel like um, as the, you know our children, you know, the children in this who are the subject of this talk, get older, they'll also get wiser, 
and their skills in the technology space will exceed what we have now and maybe we'll go back to those you know um, hark back to early days of the internet or when people are setting up their own sharing services or when you know elephant tracks invented a way for music sharing online so they could all jam together across the world like i'm hopeful that the the monopoly that's there now in the social media space might just be decimated by kids just doing their own thing Thanks for that, David. So, I, Angie, I want to ask you a slightly, well, in fact, a very different question. Uh, some of the, the land-centered thinking, country-centered thinking, is, is certainly a different way of thinking for, for, for many of us in this session today. But I think it, it's a, really a, a powerful framework, powerful thought. You also talked about some principles around the, of, of use of AI, which actually reflect a, a range of uh, indigenous thinking and it, it struck me that it's actually it seems that there's a similarity between that and some of the uh, the principles behind indigenous data sovereignty and it's something that New South Wales has been looking at as part of our efforts towards uh, closing the gap. What do you think about privacy preserving approaches to use of AI, to use of machine learning which might actually make AI safer for use and also influence the future of, of our, our hypothetical child as they grow up. So reframe that slightly. Are the principles that you described the sorts of things that would actually allow us to safely use AI in a, in a privacy preserving way? Angie, you're on mute. So when we when we think about the principles and protocols, well, in particular, the the principles, the standards, and the protocols that can and should be informing the way we conceptualise um, the current problem state, but also the future of AI, then yes, I think that data privacy and data so, data sovereignty, and then data um, privacy. Uh, can and should be central within those um, within those discussions. I guess the what's what's important to understand is that from an indigenous perspective, we have different knowledge transmission rights and rituals and protocols. So you don't just have access to all information just because um, because it's uh, because it's a human right to have access to information. Like we have cultural responsibilities, not human rights. I mean, we do have human rights now, but that's traditionally speaking. And that is, um, I guess, you know, the difference between how our societies have evolved over time. So there are various different times in your life when your your the knowledge, and of course, coming back to, you know, our culture is an oral culture. So the embedding of that knowledge come through various different cultural protocols, rites and rituals over time. And the embedding of that knowledge happens through those different cultural practices, which are often performative in nature. So our knowledges are embedded. They're embedded in the muscle. So when we're thinking about the role of uh, knowledge and data and the way that we conceptualize data sovereignty and the various different architectural systems that we uh, conceptualizing for the future of AI, then of course there's a whole range of different types of ways that we can embed values and principles and I guess the standards and ethics into these various different um, systems for uh, to protect data, to protect to protect knowledge and to protect data and in the, and the ways in which it is utilized within the machine. I think that there's incredible capacity for machines to operate on a fundamentally different level if we have better data, if we have better protocols around those, that data, and if, that, if those protocols represent the principles of social and environmental sustainability embedded within those systems, then of course the machine itself has to operate in a, in a different way. Thanks, Andy. That, that's a really, really interesting insight. We're getting, we're in the last six minutes of this session before we move to the, the, the next, where we're actually going to ask the Learned Academies uh, really to respond to today and yesterday. 
But what I would like to do is, is ask each of you, what should we be doing? Talking is useful. Identifying issues is useful. What should we really put effort into after we leave the session today? What should we be doing on Monday? What should we start to do in, in the medium term? And uh, Rob, unfairly, I'm going to start with you again. <laughs> no worries. Well, I think that uh, if I look at Labor Day, Labor Day was a, is a social contract, recognises a social contract as a result of the Industrial Revolution, a contract between employers, people, uh, employees and society. Eight hours work with um, employers, eight hours play, how we expect to behave as a society, and eight hours sleep, uh, recognising the health and well-being and continuity of society. We need a social contract of that magnitude to be able to navigate the next 50 years. Great. Well, wow. thank you, Rob. Uh, David, I'm going to ask you next, please. Um, for me, you know, it's just getting those data sets going. You know, we need to be able to catalogue what's out there and make the open data available for people to use and to really, you know, build on that ability for the kids to hack the system, you know, to, to create their own future. Wow, great, fantastic. Um, Angie? I think we need to reckon with the the business models at the heart of these various different machines and move from one of uh, accumulation to distribution. When we're thinking about um, the, the issues we have with natural resources and the current um, collapse of our environment, what, we, what it's based on is this model of, of individual accumulation instead of one from an Indigenous perspective that is based on, on natural resource management and distribution. If we continue to, to develop our, the AI and the various different other machines that come from um, AI on the same basis, then we're going to see the same, the same cataclysmic um, issues increase. So the business model itself has to change. That's very profound. And Toby, I'm going to give you the final word on this because you will link across next to the, the role of the Learned Academy. So, uh, Toby. Thanks, uh, Ian. Yeah, so for me, it begins and ends with AI literacy. If we want people to make um, responsible choices, to, to embrace the opportunities and avoid the perils of the technology, we need people to understand uh, what are the elephant traps and what are the opportunities that await? So on, on Monday morning, I hope the Department of Industry or some billionaire like Twiggy rings me up and says, okay, let's do it. Let's make Australia the most AI literate uh, country upon the planet. Uh, less ambitiously, maybe it's the minister that rings me up and says, okay, let's make New South Wales the most literate state in Australia. I hope it's the former.